Hey, 4C Divers, welcome to Facebook Live. Thank you for tuning in. We are really excited tonight. We have a fantastic presentation for you guys. So let's go ahead and do a check-in. Where are you listening in from? Say hello to us in the comment section. Are you here in Florida? Are you here in the US? Are you outside of the US? We wanna know where are you listening in from? Come say hello to us in that comment section. We also invite you guys, if you have any questions tonight for our guest presenter, to write in the comment section anything that you want to be answered. <coughs> All right, so guys, you know as it is, it is our theme month of Give Thanks to Your Oceans with 4C. Because it is Thanksgiving at the end of this month, we wanna thank our oceans for giving us beautiful you know, conditions, whether it's the corals, the fish, the wildlife, the, the ocean itself, we wanna make sure that we're keeping it nice and healthy so we have something to dive in. So that being said, all of our themed uh, presentations and our uh, events are gonna be ocean conservation themed. And we have a fantastic presentation by Michael Patrick O'Neill. Hi, Michael, how's it going? Hi, Nicole, how are you? Awesome. All right. So we'll let him start in just a second, but you guys know the drill. <clears throat> you want to get in on the raffle tonight. You're going to want to go to www.force-e.com. Go to our event tab, click on tonight's event and register before 645. Because if you don't, you don't get your name in the raffle. And tonight we're going to be raffling off one of Michael's books. Yes, he is a published author. So if you want to take on this raffle, go to that website, make sure you're registered by 645. I will put the link in the comment section for you guys in just a little bit. But let's go ahead, oh, there everybody is, they're all saying hello to you. Hi guys, thanks for tuning in. All right, the ocean is calming down, you guys. We had fantastic conditions today. We had one to two foot seas and we have better viz now. So get out there this weekend and go diving. All right, give us a call, we'll get you booked on a boat. Right now, the Blue Heron Bridge, unfortunately, uh, we think they're dumping Lake Okeechobee, so there's no viz and there is an advisory to the water. So uh, stay away from the bridge today and tomorrow and let's see what happens over the weekend and see if that advisory gets lifted. But if not, get offshore. There's beautiful, um, colorful reefs and animals waiting to see you. All right, <clears throat> Michael Patrick O'Neill, are you ready? I'm ready. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you and bring up your slides. All right, thanks so much, Nicole. Thanks everyone for being here. Um, I greatly appreciate it. Uh, I go way back with 4C. I was just telling Nicole when we were getting ready that I bought my first set of dive gear at 4C in 1992, 29 years ago. And uh, they're an awesome group of people skip kathy bill black and many others that i'm very grateful for their excellent service and friendship so that's a good place to be and um it's a great shop uh, and i've seen many here in the last 30 years that i've been diving and living here in palm beach county a little bit about myself and my work before we get started uh, i'm a professional photographer and author i've uh written photographed eight books one of which will be raffled off uh, this evening my work focuses around water whether it's fresh water or salt water and i've developed a successful career with conservation and education i've developed a program in which i've gone all over the country and presented to more than half a million kids and adults and all my books and my presentations are designed to encourage people of all ages to get involved in reading, writing, science, and conservation. And uh, I've had the privilege of going all over the world, and I'm often asked, what's my favorite place to dive? And without hesitation, I say Florida. <clears throat> I strongly believe that exploration starts in our own doorstep, okay? And in today's program, I'm going to share with you some of my favorite photo projects from Florida that are in my brand new book called Meet Me Underwater, a photographic celebration of Florida's aquatic wonders. And this book is available for sale at 4C and it makes a wonderful gift. Um, I think you'll enjoy it. So we're going to start the program here and I'm going to touch base a little bit 
on uh, what the book focuses on, and then I'll be happy to answer some questions you may have. And uh, so, if Nicole, if you could please forward the next slide. These are my seven books. The next slide, ooh, my brand new one, Meet Me Underwater. And I did a book for people who love Florida. I dedicate the book to all Floridians and to people who come here, fall in love with a place, and then they may go home and uh, have memories that last a lifetime. So this book is for people who dive, people who like fishing, people who like swimming with the manatee. We're simply enjoying our wonderful wetlands and it goes from fresh to salt and a little bit in between. So let's continue here, Nicole. Thanks for forwarding the slide. If you could please start the video, this is a drone video. I don't know how well it's playing there, uh, but this is Singer Island. It's Florida's easternmost point. And it's kind of like the epicenter of where all the really good action usually happens. Okay, this is very close to the Gulf Stream. And the best way I can describe the Gulf Stream, it's a river of warm water in the ocean. And it's a big highway for all kinds of aquatic animals. And having completed more than 3,500 dives, many of them, most of them here in Florida, I've seen pretty much everything there is to see here. And if I couldn't travel anywhere anymore and be here permanently, it wouldn't be a bad place to be. So let's continue here. Uh, the first section of the presentation <clears throat> focuses on blackwater diving. Before I jump into the photos, let me explain what a blackwater dive is and why we do it. At night when you're brushing your teeth and getting ready to fall asleep in your bed, one of the world's largest animal migrations is taking place rising up from abyssal depths tiny planktonic creatures come up from hundreds of feet to feed near the ocean surface surface at daybreak when you're getting ready to go to work the reverse happens these animals are migrating to the bottom of the ocean where they live during the day it's just way too deep for a scuba diver to go and see them you would need a submarine so what do we do weather permitting usually once or twice a week and i think there's a trip tomorrow night weather permitting we get on the dive boat usually around 7 30 p.m and we go offshore into the gulf stream skirt the gulf stream current in water that's roughly 700 feet deep we jump into the water, and this sounds kind of crazy, and in the beginning, five or six years ago, when I started doing this kind of diving, I was very apprehensive. And uh, But I learned to, I like to use the word surrender, and just accept that I'm in a big ocean at night, worry about the things that I can control, and let the current take me. And when I'm out there at night taking these photos, I feel like an astronaut in outer space. But I have a scuba tank on my back and an underwater camera in my hand. And it's very, very challenging to find these sea creatures. Most of them are smaller than an inch, some a little bit bigger. And it's extremely challenging to take good photos. And again, you're photographing animals that are coming up from extreme depths to feed near the surface of the ocean. And that's your small window of time to photograph them. And usually the dive charter will give us two hours in the water. And we all have these big 120, 120 cubic foot scuba tanks. Some people even have bigger ones and you have to know how to manage your air so you don't start off very deep and then run out of air when maybe things are heating up and getting really good. So it takes to, it takes a little bit of strategy. And how do you stay safe and not get lost in that huge ocean? When you jump in the water, the dive boat 
crew puts in this illuminated buoy with a rope that goes down to about 60 feet. And your job as a responsible, competent diver is to stay near that illuminated buoy. And everybody, the divers, the buoy, and the dive boat all drift together in the Gulf Stream current. And just to give you an idea, the current is so strong that it's not unusual to go 10 miles or more during that that time frame it's incredible and uh, sometimes we see sharks sea turtles blue marlin you never know what's going to show up so what's all the excitement about if nicole could please forward the slides i'll show you some of the animals that are found there this is a sea robin as an adult you can pr probably find them at the blue heron bridge but at night adrift they look like this. This is a spectacular specimen. I photographed it at around 100 feet deep. My personal limit. The next photo, please. This is a very rare type of uh, fish called the cusk eel. It's about two inches long. And um, some scientists believe that it should Sometimes it imitates the feathers of a seabird floating on the surface of the ocean. Pretty crazy, but if you let your imagination run wild a little bit, you can see what I'm talking about. Next slide, please. This is a cute little uh, uh, batfish. Uh, they are also found in the Blue Heron Bridge. What's so adorable about these little guys when they're about an inch or two in length they resemble a little uh, spaceman or spacewoman, astronaut, in their little cocoon adrift in the ocean. Very, very challenging to get a good photo. Next slide, please. Uh, one of my absolute favorite shots, this is a flying fish in motion. To get the blurred effect, I use the slow shutter and pan the camera. There's no Photoshop in this photo, by the way, in and in, in, in the others as well, just straight photography. And this photo has been very, very good to me. Uh, I won some major awards with it. And uh, it's a depiction of a popular subject in a different kind of way. So it's kind of fun to... Um, it's kind of fun to be creative and... In, in, Photograph these common animals in different ways. That, that's what photography is all about for me, is seeing things from a different angle. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Another favorite of mine, this is a little drift fish. It's about the size of a dime, and it's actually inside the jellyfish. And these little fish are very, very vulnerable. There's a lot of predators at night in the Gulf Stream. Things like squid just eat these little fish all day long and all night long. And as a strategy, they will ride jellyfish, they'll ride salps. And even though these larger organisms are transparent, at least they have a very thin membrane that protects them from the predator. And it gives them a split second of advantage to maybe get away. Next slide, please. All right, a little bit about endangered species. Uh, next one. All right, a favorite of mine, another well-known photo. This is a Goliath grouper with a friend of mine, a very talented, gifted photographer, Doug Seifert, who used to live in Jupiter and now lives in Canada. And this is a... Uh, photo from 2006 on the Zion Express, which is a, an amazing shipwreck offshore Jupiter. And this is when the Goliath grouper aggregations were just getting started. And they were something out of this world. <clears throat> the Goliath grouper is a controversial animal. It has been protected now for 30 years. They started the protection started in 1990 because they had been decimated by fishermen and spear fishermen in the 80s and 70s. 
And from 1990 to the present, they made a remarkable comeback. And they're a source of a lot of revenue for local dive shops and dive charters who take uh, scuba divers like you and I to go see this natural phenomenon. Now the rub is the fishing community is using the Goliath grouper as a scapegoat and blaming the species for decimating food fish such as snapper and grouper. And there's been uh, several studies that show <clears throat> that Goliath groupers typically don't eat these animals. They eat junk fish like puffers, snake eels, crabs. They really don't prey on the fish that we like to eat. But being big and opportunistic and smart, they will definitely take a fish that has been hooked. It's a no-brainer for a smart predator like this one. So, there are proposals on the table to open a limited fishery of small immature fish throughout the state with the exception of South Florida. I'm not really sure how it's going to look. I would prefer to keep the Goliath grouper protected. And uh, let's see what happens. Uh, next slide, please. They are very friendly. Here's a favorite photo of mine, a selfie with the Goliath grouper. I like to joke that they're so friendly, you can put your arm around one and take one home. And they're very docile, especially when they are uh, spawning on the deep shipwrecks, usually in late July, August, and September. Next slide, please. You can see how big they are. This photo is from this year in Jupiter. The MG-111, which is a sunk, sunken barge, was very, very good. The little fish that you see surrounding the Goliath grouper are called cigar minnows. And some scientists believe that they accompany the Goliath grouper to eat the eggs of the Goliath grouper. And I have also personally seen and photographed the Goliath grouper eating the cigar minnow. So uh, they're both eating each other, really. And it's an amazing sight. The little bait fish, from a photographer's standpoint, can be also very, very annoying because they're very reflective. They get in the way. So when you're photographing the Goliath grouper, you have to get very, very close. Next slide, please. I think this is a little video. Nicole, if you could please hit the advanced key. Here we go. It should start to play. And here's a, a pair of Goliath groupers on the MG111. I'm filming this, guys, with a uh, fisheye lens. You can see how close I am. I could touch and kiss this fish if I wanted to. They are extremely docile. I am so passionate about animals in general, especially sea creatures. I still find it hard to believe that in 2021, 2022, we're almost there. There's still people that wish to harm these amazing, harmless animals that bring in so much money to the South Florida dive community. And they're gentle giants. They're like big, friendly cows. And I would think that in this day and age of environmental enlightenment, we would know better. But... That's the human race for you. We can all do our part, and I hope you do yours to, to protect the Goliath groupers. All right, what's next? Uh, a little more Goliath. Oh, another favorite. These are small tooth sawfish, and they are extremely, extremely challenging to find and hard to photograph. If I'm not mistaken, it's one of the first marine fish to become federally protected. I think that happened 15, 17 years ago. And uh, it's very tough to see them. Typically, they are found in estuaries in southwest Florida where the water is like chocolate milk and you can't even see your hands in front of you. And back in winter of 2017, a friend of mine 
called me on a Sunday or sent me a message and said that he saw a bunch of sawfish up in Hope Sound. On Tuesday, two days later, I chartered the dive boat just for myself at great expense. And I went up there uh, with a dive master and we swam and we swam and we swam. And my head was this big. I suffer from migraines. It was so much effort. The water was cold. But we found them. And we marked the location with a GPS. And that day and a second following day, we dove with these amazing dinosaurs. And I was able to get these photos. And I believe this is the first photo ever of three sawfish together in one frame. They are huge. Next slide, please. This is a big pregnant female. The guy in the back is there to show you how large they are. In photography, you always want to show scale. And this is with a fisheye lens. And there's no cropping at all. So I'm very, very close. And in certain situations, I could almost touch the sawfish if I wanted to. I avoid touching marine animals. But that's how close I was. A religious experience. I've been very successful with these images because they're so hard to get. And every single time that I've been back up there at Hope Sound, I have failed. I haven't seen any more sawfish. They're there. People see them. But it's very, very challenging because up there, you're away from the Gulf Stream. It's an area that's very silty, low visibility. Uh, it's not a pretty place to dive. There's a lot of rocks, a lot of big sharks. Uh, it's, uh, it's, I love it, but it's a challenging place. It's deep. And uh, you really have to be lucky. And looking at back at my images, I, uh, I, I'm so grateful for the luck that I had diving there on two occasions and, and just really nailing it. Next slide, please. A little bit about sharks. Um, we have in the state of Florida several shark species that are no-take species, meaning that they're protected in state waters okay that means that they're protected within three miles from the coast farther offshore they're not protected and some of these that are protected include the tiger shark next one please the great hammerhead one more please and the lemon shark um I'll never forget, I was one of the first people here uh, to dive with sharks in 2013. It's the year that things really took off. And I remember prior to 2013, myself and friends here who have a lot of diving experience, a lot more than I do, we would go out there and look and look and look, and the sharks were just absent. So something happened in 2013 that suddenly we had all kinds of sharks and it's an area in the dive community here that has just simply exploded. I lost track now of how many boats do shark dives. It's kind of a controversial thing. I'm not here to argue whether I'm for it or against it, but I think it's an amazing uh, fact that here in Florida, we have a very, very healthy shark population some people will even claim that it's too healthy i think there's no such thing uh sharks are apex predators uh one thing that we have to understand about nature is that nature is very very efficient there's no real surplus in nature if there is surplus nature takes care of it and cuts out the fat very very quickly so the sharks that are there that exist right here offshore are there for a reason. And every single shark swimming out there is fulfilling a very important role in the environment. So um, they belong there. They belong there more than we do. Think about that. So let's protect our sharks. Uh, 
it's uh, an amazing fact that Florida has, what, 22 million people, and we have a shark, healthy shark population, and so many places in the world now are fished out because their sharks are, are caught for fins and leather and meat and so forth. Next slide, please. This photo is a recent photo, um, just a few months old, the Caribbean reef shark, a protected species um, in a beautiful dive site, one of my favorites called the Tunnel. And this uh, beautiful reef shark has a pack of jacks on it and no feeding involved in this photo. Very curious shark. Consider yourself lucky if you see one underwater. Um, they're not there to eat you or harm you. They're just curious. Treat them with respect, and I can assure you that um, they're not going to bother you. Next slide, please. We get so excited about sharks, and we're so afraid. And I love to use this chart with data from the FWC. The information, granted, is about 10 years old, but... I think if it was updated, it would show similar numbers. From a period of 2001 to 2013, in the United States, sharks killed only 11 people. Look at the number of people killed by dogs. Not that one in the photo, but big dogs that unfortunately uh, sometimes uh, get a little bit out of control. So I use this chart to um, show that going to the beach or going for a dive, the drive to the dive shop, the drive to the dive boat or to the beach is far more dangerous than getting in the water and enjoying our beautiful water. Next slide, please. All right, my favorite animal, and I had to touch a little bit on sea turtles, is a leatherback sea turtle. Uh, this photo is 20 years old. I shot it in Shark Canyon, a beautiful reef close to my house here, on slide film. Most people now won't even know what slide film is. Uh, it's my favorite sea creature. I've been very lucky to photograph a bunch of leatherbacks. It cost me a small fortune. I almost have a fanatical obsession with them. And it's an amazing animal. It's a citizen of the world. The next slide will show you that. These are tracks of leatherbacks crossing the open ocean. Swimming from Canada to Florida or the Caribbean takes about as much effort for a leatherback sea turtle as it does for us to walk around the block. They are made for swimming. They don't stop swimming. The only thing that will make them stop swimming is a fishing net, uh, a collision with a boat, uh, an unfortunate encounter with another human being. But they crisscross the oceans. And while we do a good job, not perfect, but a good job protecting them here in Florida, and other countries do the same thing, they still have to cross dangerous open water where they may eat plastic, they may get hit by a boat, they may get killed for food, they may get trapped in a net or in a lobster pot with ropes, and it's a very dangerous place for them there. So what we all have to do is think about the global implications of our day-to-day -day lives. And that's why I, uh, I pick up garbage that doesn't belong to me. And if we all took a little bit of initiative when we're in the water, picking up particularly plastic, fishing line, plastic bags, these items stay in the water for a long, long time. And the leatherback sea turtle has been around for over 100 million years but it may not survive our generation because of uh, all the stuff that we do to our planet. But I'm an optimist. I believe that the human heart is the most powerful thing in, in the world. 
And if we have a little bit of love for these animals, we can make a big difference. And in fact, it looks like the number of leatherbacks is slowly starting to rebound, which is amazing news. Next slide, please. And if you haven't been to the Loggerhead Marine Life Center, they're one of several sea turtle rehabilitation centers along the east coast of Florida and the east coast of the United States. And they do a spectacular job rescuing sea turtles, operating them, operating on them, and uh, releasing them back in the wild. Unfortunately, not all of them make it, but because of good people like, like these individuals, most of them do make it. And by the way, a, a small plug, I'm doing a presentation at, on December 4th at the Loggerhead Marine Life Center. That's where the book launch was just a few months ago. So uh, I invite you to come by and say hello and uh, purchase a book and get it signed for Christmas. Uh, next slide, please. A little green sea turtle uh, talking about conservation. In the early 80s, about 40 years ago, it's my understanding that there was only several hundred green sea turtle nests in the entire state of Florida. When I was researching my book, uh, Meet Me Underwater, I, I almost fell off the chair. Nowadays, during peak years, and sea turtles nest, one year is great, another year is a little bit low, it's, it's seasonal. There's like a, a peak and a valley rhythm to it. But this is the important thing. Nowadays, during a good year, we can have more than 40,000 nests of green sea turtles in the entire state of Florida. 40 years ago, there were only several hundred. And what's happened in the last 40 years? The population in the state of Florida has gone through the roof. We're now the third most populous state in the country after California and Texas. We just surpassed New York. We have all these people here living with us and the sea turtles are doing great. But that doesn't mean we can put our guard down. We have to keep up the good work, picking up our garbage, super important taking care of our water because if we have contaminated water nicole just mentioned the water in the blue heron bridge and the release from lake okeechobee that's causing uh horrible horrible damage to our wetlands to manatees to sea turtles so we have to fix that problem all right next slide please all right i think this is it uh last project that I want to share with you is the mullet migration, which just concluded here a few weeks ago. Go ahead, please. Something magical happens here in Palm Beach County around mid-September. For reasons that are still not clear to us all, mullet move from freshwater estuaries to the beach and then from the beach on to the deep ocean to spawn. And they stage on the beaches. We don't know if this is temperature driven. We don't know if it's the diminishing amount of daylight in the fall. But all we know is that suddenly in places like Juno Beach or Singer Island, next slide please, it looks like we have a massive oil spill, but it's not oil, it's millions and millions of fish and you can see the school of fish several miles long coming down the beach and it's a wonderful story that finally is getting a lot of attention i've worked as a cameraman on uh, several documentaries filming the mullet uh, and it's super exciting next slide please the water boils with fish they jump out of the water in spectacular fashion uh it's uh the time commitment is prohibitive because for example you can go down to the palm beach inlet at 11 o'clock in the morning and it can be quiet it can be completely dead and then 35 minutes later the ocean can look like this 
So it requires a lot of effort and time to get these shots. And I've been working the mullet migration since 2014. Uh, the last good year, in my opinion, was 2018, three years ago. The last three years, for the most part, we've had lousy visibility. Why? Because of the water quality issues that we're having. So we have to fix that problem. Next slide, please. Uh, one of my favorite shots. This guy is a Singer Island local surfing, getting out of the water very quickly because something big is chasing those banana-sized mullet. What could be chasing the mullet? Let's take a look. Next slide, please. The most common predator is the tarpon. Tarpon are like big, giant sardines. Don't worry. We have nothing to worry about from the tarpon. They're not going to bite you or eat you. They're just interested in the mullet. Next slide, please. Uh, the tarpon join forces with black tip sharks. And in this photo, one of my favorites and super hard to get shows a uh, tarpon hunting with two black tip sharks. An enormous effort. The school is moving down the beach very quickly. I'm not using dive gear. I'm just using my fins, mask, and snorkel, and I'm running down the beach with my gear to anticipate where the action is going to take place. I have a little bit of experience doing this, so I know where to position myself. Uh, so I don't get accidentally bitten by these black tip sharks. The moral of the story is you don't want to stay in the bait ball. The visibility is very, very limited. And you run the risk, a real one, of getting bitten by these black tips. They're not big sharks. They're four or five feet long. But they're very excited. They're snapping at everything. So what do I do is I swim right through the school very quickly. I stay at the deep end, and what happens is the tarpon and the sharks push the bait against the sand, and they trap them there. So you stay in the clear water. The sharks can see you. You can see the sharks. Everybody's very happy. Nobody's getting in the way of somebody else, and you can go to town and take photos till the cows come home. It's a lot of fun. It's my favorite time of the year. Unfortunately, because of the water quality issue we've had recently, shots like this have not been possible, at least here recently. Uh, I've heard of great action down in Miami Beach, of all places, in Fort Lauderdale last year. But this year, it's been challenging. And I, I hope it goes back to the good old days. Next slide, please. All right, I freshwater. Let's talk a little bit about freshwater. I think this is the last section. Go ahead, please. Next slide. All right, this is in Florida, boys and girls. You know, we were uh, so many of us, uh, so many of my colleagues, all they do is dive in the ocean and they don't pay attention to what's inland. And it's fascinating. And, um, any time that the water's dirty or rough, uh, schedule permitting, I jump in the car and I go to North Florida to swim in the springs. This is uh, one of my favorite ones near Ocala. It's almost something out of a travel brochure. Next slide, please. Uh, in the summertime, some of these springs have hundreds, if not thousands of fish. And it's like swimming in an aquarium. The water is nice and cool at 72 degrees. The air temperature is in the mid-90s. This is in the summer, obviously. And it's just a wonderful experience to be, um, to be in the water and enjoying this. Uh, and then you don't have to rinse your camera or dive gear. That's another plus that I like. Next slide, please. Again, another slide, another spring shot of my fiance that's in my new book. Uh, so many places to explore in Florida. The only downside is that it's such a large state, 
some of these uh, springs are five, six hours by car from where we live here in South Florida. But I guarantee you the drive is worth it. With the cooler weather now that we're having, uh, I will be going up there again soon um, because it's a time of the year that the ocean is usually rough. And with a little bit of uh, insulation, like a thick wetsuit, you can go there and enjoy it. And uh, I'm sure you're going to love it if you haven't been yet. Next slide, please. I also do a lot of things in the Everglades. Uh, I've spent a lot of time photographing alligators. How do I get a shot like this without putting myself in danger? I use what's called a pole cam. I attach my underwater camera to a long metal pole. I have a remote control and uh, it's uh, very, very challenging. As we all know, you cannot feed the alligators. I think you'll even be thrown in jail. And sometimes they're cooperative and sometimes they just hang out there. And to get my first shot like this, I spent countless hours and I think I drove something like 3,000 miles. Think about that. I live 150 miles from this one spot in Big Cypress. So a round trip is 300 miles. And I went there 10 times to get my first shot. That's the kind of effort that I have to put into my photos. Next slide, please. And I think we're wrapping up here with a little bit of manatees. They're simply adorable. They have a very special place in my heart. Uh, as mentioned, they've had a very tough year. This year, I think we had over a thousand fatalities with manatees, the biggest culprits is lack of food, boat strikes, and cold weather. And you're probably wondering, how are manatees starving and why? We have so much habitat. Well, the problem is the habitat is not healthy because of contaminated water, which kills the seagrass, which is a main component of the manatees diet so without food these animals are not going to survive and it goes back to the point that i made earlier is we can do everything in, within our power to protect sea turtles sharks manatees dolphins you name it your favorite marine animal or freshwater animal but if we don't have good water quality all this wonderful work is in vain we must do a better job keeping our water pure, free of contamination. It's not a problem that's going to be resolved tomorrow. It's going to take time. It's going to be expensive. And politicians of every stripe have been kicking the can down the road because nobody really has the guts to address the problem. Maybe now, but we have to see. One more slide, please. And here's a wonderful little guy pigging out at a local spring in North Florida. Uh, springs have the warmth with the warm water, but they don't have the food. So as cold fronts come and go, manatees leave the spring to feed, and then they come back. And this chubby little guy was lucky to find a bunch of vegetation in the spring, and he was really going to town eating as much as he could uh, and uh, he was a lucky one to find the food in the spring because as mentioned there's normally no food there next one please uh, the FWC uh, the Miami Sea Aquarium the US Fish and Wildlife Service NOAA all these organizations do incredible work rescuing and rehabilitating and releasing uh, manatees. And I was able to participate uh, in several. And here's a manatee getting ready to be released. They take photos, they weigh the animal, they mark the animal where the scars are so they can identify the animals. These people do an incredible job. Next slide, please. All right, this is my last photo one of my absolute favorites. I took this, I think, in 2008 in Crystal River of a very playful manatee. 
I used a, a blurred, uh, I mean a slow shutter to get the blurred action of the man's arm moving. And as we all know in Florida, it's highly illegal to ride a manatee. But if the manatee tries to ride you, there's nothing we can do, right? And also, you know, this little manatee means no harm. He just wants to play, and it's a fun, cute photo. I use it in my programs. I have it published in one of my books, uh, Wild Waters. And uh, thousands of people, including myself, have had a very good belly laugh with this photo. Uh, and whoever this person is, I just want to thank him for being at the right place at the right time. All right, what's next here? All right, one thing that I've become involved in, which is brand new, is a foundation that I created called Into the Blue. And people who know me uh, know that I go into schools and I do presentations, and I've had the privilege of presenting now to half a million kids in 26 states, France and Brazil virtually, and it's something that I believe in. So the Into the Blue Foundation will remove the financial burden of having a presenter at the school and will also donate one of my books for free to every child in attendance. So we're just finally getting started. We got delayed because of COVID. And I hope to do my first school presentations with this wonderful foundation early next year. So I'll keep you guys informed on our progress. And our last slide, if you want to follow me, uh, my social media links are there. And basically, they concentrate exclusively on my photo projects, my presentations, my books, so uh, this is a way to, um, to see what I'm up to. And I keep everything uh, updated regularly. And uh, anyway, so that's my program. I see a lot of comments here. I haven't uh, looked at any questions here. Nicole, if you want, I can pick uh, four or five questions and answer them. Is that okay? I actually have them all written down, so I... Have an order all right. to ask you. All right, perfect. Let me know uh, if you want me to answer any. Awesome. Well, thank you. What a fantastic presentation. Thanks a bunch. Oh my gosh, some beautiful photography. And you know, being a fan of yours, it's you know, I've seen some of them, and some of them are new to me. So it was great to see that. And some some of them I know the stories behind too. So um it's it's pretty cool to be able to see some of this stuff. And and guys, if you ever have a chance to meet um Michael Patrick O'Neill in person, you know, he, he can tell you some cool stories that he's you know, around the world and he's seen some cool stuff. And, you know, the biggest thing about, um, you know, doing photography for conservation is that you, you get asked by a lot of people to get, you know, these pretty photos cause they're trying to put it in magazines or, you know, or sometimes, film. but you know, sometimes it's the, the weird photos. And I know you showed some that just, it might not be the most, uh, you know, what you want to frame and put on your wall, but it tells the story of the animal and its behavior and the way it reacts in the environment and with others in the environment. So I know a lot of people really like seeing that sardine run with the two sharks and the tarpon and how they all interact together. And that's what speaks volumes when it comes to a photo. Um, I can tell you one of my favorite photos that is yours, you didn't put it in your slideshow, is... Um, when I used to dive on narcosis and you did a photo of everybody cleaning up underwater and it's like, I, I'm, so, I'm so, I'm so glad you brought that up. I was going to say, um, those photos have gone viral so many times. Yeah. They've been published all over the place. And, uh, I, I, I did another presentation earlier today with this lady in uh, this group in uh, Pompano or, or Hollywood rather. And I was, this is the one advice I have for people who like to take photos. I personally believe 
that social media is ruining photography. And I'm going to explain why. Because all of us, myself included, and I'm guilty of this, we're only posting things that we think people are going to like. Okay? I love hummingbirds. I, I really do. But how many hummingbird pictures have you seen me post? Three or four out of a thousand? Because I know it's not going to get a response. So we tend to put things that people you think that people are going to like, and we're keeping to ourselves our personal favorites. So my message to you, all of you, is to be brave to put what you believe in, whether it's hummingbirds or garbage or whatever you want to do. Don't follow the crowd. Be be an individual and i think that's so important and i have used those photos of the garbage which by the way was completely unplanned i was on the dive on the horseshoe and uh, the crew of the narcosis came by collecting garbage and it was a classic case of being at the right place at the right time so my message is do what you love and don't follow the crowd um and uh I, I, I can't emphasize that enough. And thanks for bringing that up, Nicole. Yeah, I mean, I dive a lot as well and I carry my camera with me, but there's times that I have to just stop and I put my camera down and I go, you know what? This needs to be solved. There's fishing line, there's garbage. Absolutely, I absolutely. And I go, well, I didn't get a photo of that, but I know in my head that I contributed. And sometimes I'll just be like, hey guys, come help me. and I'll get photos of people diving. I mean, we had our Halloween dive, uh, you know, a couple weeks ago, and we found a like a plastic like table for like an outdoor lawn set, and the guy totally grabbed it, rigged it, shot it to the surface. It was great, and I was able to get photos of it, which was fantastic because it's usually me <laughs> doing mm -hmm. doing the cleaning up, but it's great to be able to get that because it not only expressed like what humans can do to help um, when it comes to conservation and free, um, but it's also a way to reward someone when they've done a good deed. And we posted on our social media and everyone mm -hmm. congratulated and said, thank you for removing. Or even it's so funny, a lot of times I get, when I take a photo of a, a lionfish and people go, that's a beautiful photo, but did you kill it? And it's like, yeah, it's tough. <laughs> you know, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I don't encourage having multiple things stringing off of you when you're diving, but if you're a good diver and you can multitask, it's fantastic. But that's why I like diving with people who, you know, somebody who has a lionfish spear and maybe somebody who has the gear to be able to rig up um, some marine debris and bring it up. So I'm always diving with lots of divers that can help me. Mm -hmm. And we dive for a purpose, basically. And That's right. And, and you made a great point is um, if we all took the initiative to pick up that plastic bag or the fishing line and, it, you know, uh, our reefs here are in pretty good shape. I have seen the breakers go through cycles of looking horrible and looking great. And nature is so resilient and powerful we only need to give it a little bit of a break and it comes back on on its own and we just need to uh motivate people to take the initiative i think yep definitely so you know i'm going back to when it comes to the photography behavior is a huge um thing for me. I think when you get behavior on an image instead of just a straight on picture of a turtle, mm -hmm. that feeding behavior, you get maybe the mating behavior, you're capturing what that animal is doing. And it helps with, you know, understanding what the animal is doing in its environment. But those are the kind of photos that, you know, scientific researchers are looking for. I, we have people here locally that are constantly looking for We've got the sea turtle guy, uh, Larry Wood, Dr. Larry Wood with uh, mm -hmm. hospitals. He wants photos of, and he wants to know, you know, where are these guys hanging out? Because he, you know, does the tagging and the research. There's Goliath groupers. There's sharks. I mean, we have all these guys. And if you're a fan of watching our Facebook lives, you've met them. Uh, it's all you guys that are watching right now. 
you've met some of these scientists and they are constantly looking for imagery. And that is one way, if you want to give back on your imagery, these guys are looking for it because they're constantly, you know, trying to get people interested in their work so that they can get grants and they can get, you know, donations. And that's one way to bring your photography to help conservation. I know, Michael, you've done a lot with um, the, you know, organizations that are like a little bit bigger mainstream, like, you know, documentaries and, you know, TV um, and, and, and stuff like that. So, I mean, for you, you're on assignment, you know, you're getting a specific photo or video for something. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, that's kind of as your profession. So, you know, there are people who do this for a profession and there's others that do it, you know, because they love doing it and whatever photographer you are, um, we encourage it. So, <laughs> all right. So I have a few questions here. Um, somebody wanted to know in the Blackwater dives, uh, they wanted to know what lens you were using um, because they were just in awe of how crisp your photo was. And you said mm -hmm. you, didn't, you didn't edit them in Photoshop. No. So which, uh, what's your, your setup on that? I use uh, the preferred go-to lens by everybody, including myself is the Nikon 60 millimeter lens, okay? Uh, Nikon also makes a 105. If you go out with a 105 millimeter lens, you're going to have a very frustrating night. And the 60 does the best job possible. I think Canon, if you're a Canon shooter, Canon has a 50 and a 100. I've never shot Canon, but if I did, I would go with a 50. Okay. So um, another person asked about, is there any petition that they could sign to help with this Goliath grouper um, uh, decision with the, the limited harvest? Uh, there was or there still may be, but the best way to make a difference and I speak from personal experience. If I'm not mistaken, um, the Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission has four meetings per year. And they listen very carefully to the public. And I know that for a fact because three or four years ago, I was part of the team one of many people who went up to Orlando and elsewhere to speak at the FWC meeting to change the rules concerning land-based shark fishing. And guess what? We changed the law. These sharks were dying on the beach, being abused by people who have no concern for animal welfare, no respect for animals, and a small group of people was able to change the law in the state of Florida. So never underestimate the power that you have as a regular citizen, okay? Uh, I also participated in several FWC meetings where Goliath grouper were discussed. And I believe that if it weren't for the involvement of the dive community, the conclusions taken by the FWC would have been a lot worse. Okay? Awesome. I'm not in favor of taking Goliath groupers. I just want to say that for the record. But the final proposal of the FWC... I found to be acceptable. And I say this, and I don't want to raise the ire of my fellow divers. Because look, if you remember the proposals, you can't take a Goliath bigger than 36 inches. You can't take one south of Palm Beach, south of Martin County. You have to pay a $500 tag. They did a pretty good job to protect the big fish and they made it expensive that I doubt anybody's going to go and pay 500 bucks to catch a fish this big. And my hope 
is that they don't play around with these conclusions. I don't know if everything is finalized, but what all I'm saying is it could have been a lot worse because the fishermen absolutely hate the Goliath grouper. Yes. They hate it. It's a scapegoat. And this year, myself and other people, and maybe you saw them too, Nicole, Goliath groupers that have been disfigured by fishing tackle and maimed. And these people could care less. Mm -hmm. So I have met a lot of people from the FWC. They're good people. I like them. I get along with them. And one thing that they have told me, no user group is ever going to get everything that they want. And I think the dive community, if these proposals stay like they are, shouldn't really complain about what happened. Again, I'm not for it, but it could have been a lot worse. That's all I'm saying. Absolutely. And like you said, some of the people are saying here, the fight's not over, guys. So, you know, look at the way the dive community here in South Florida rallied behind the, the, the bridge. Bridge. Yeah. So we, we came, we came together. We made sure everybody understood in the higher positions of the FWC <coughs> and the county knew, you know, that this is a gem and we need to protect it. And so we got that, um, you know, no take uh, on scuba and, um, and, you know, it was fantastic. People, you know, people really need to applaud the dive community for that. So thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Especially there are people listening that were a part of it. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, okay. So I wanted to, let me hide this and bring in here. Okay. So this is your website that I pulled up. Um, mm -hmm. if you guys at home want to see any more photography, whether it's, a uh, you know, ocean photography, but he also talked about land photography he's done. Uh, you can go to uh, Michael Patrick O'Neill's website. I actually put it in the uh, comment section. I, I put the link in there. So if you want to check that out. Also, um, we talked about, um, Michael, you are a published author. So there are all of the books that we have at 4C. And um, you guys can get them online or in the stores. And we are going to go ahead and give away the meet me underwater since that was the theme of tonight's presentation. So let's go ahead and get to our random name picker. There's everyone's names and here we go. Ta -da 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 Winner of the book, John, John Bores. If you are listening, give us a thumbs up. Give us an emoji that's like this. Woo! If you have an emoji like this. <laughs> but basically, uh, John, you are the winner of the online uh raffle here and we're gonna be giving you one of the books and if you get to meet michael patrick o'neill then he'll sign it for you but um you know he's he definitely you said that you're gonna be doing a presentation can you, can you yeah november me? november 4th um, i'm i'm sorry december 4th i'm at the loggerhead marine life center it's a saturday the specific time has not yet been determined but i'm guessing it's going to be early afternoon Okay, awesome. So you guys put that on your calendar. Also, one thing, you know, it is our Give Thanks to Your Oceans Month, everyone. So make sure you go to the 4C website, check out this landing page. Here it is. We have a blog about, uh, you know, who no one wants a trashy ocean, about little plastics, what you can do. Here's some um, also information. We had a presentation last year about um, little plastics in the oceans. Uh, we have reusable bags when you shop at 4C. We have the coral ecology course, and we have next week a scientist talking about the coral planting that they're doing here in the South Florida area. So make sure that you tune in for that. And also, please make sure you're using reef safe, eco friendly sunscreens and other products. So we do have some of those things on our online store for you to purchase. And that's all we have for tonight. So thank you so much. Uh, Michael for this fantastic presentation. Thank you everybody at home listening and as we say, let's grab our gear and go diving All right. See you everyone. Thanks everybody. Appreciate it. Thanks Nicole